Hello, today is Sunday, August the 4th, 1991. My name's Earl Chess. I'm an alcoholic. I invite you to listen to the 8th Annual Shenandoah Valley Roundup at Orkney Springs, Virginia. Thank you. I hope you like this tape. Welcome to the Roundup, final day. I'm here to give you a welcome and goodbye. That's the benefits of Sunday morning. How's your all's attitude this morning? You need an attitude adjustment? There's this big old Texan married this little bitty gal. She's about six, uh, six, three hundred pounds. And she was about 98 pounds soaking wet. And they got married and went to the hotel. And he pulled his pants off and he handed them to her and said, you put these on. She said, I can't wear them. Said, put them on. She put them on, pull them around the neck. She said, see, I told you. She said, now you know who the boss of this family is. She reached down and pulled hers off said, here, you put these on. She said, I can't put them things on. I said, put them on. She said, I cannot get in them little pants. She said, that's right, and you're not going to unless you change your damned attitude. <laughs> Come back next year and make a special effort to come up and say hi to me. Yeah, everyone that's got, that I've got to know since I sobered up has been a blessing in my sobriety. And this is this weekend's no exception. And with that, before I start to cry, I'm going to turn it over to Elwood. Everybody, my name is Elwood Hook, and I'm a very grateful alcoholic. <laughs> I guess you all noticed from looking at programs, they've done their damnedest to keep me away from up here, but it's almost impossible. Harvard right now, he's ticketing this damn fly, kept flying around his head. God said, that's a Zuzu fly. He said, what the hell is a Zuzu fly? He said, it's a fly that flies around horses' ass. said, you call me a horse's ass? He said, no sir, but since you can't fool a Zuzu fly. <laughs> My purpose up here this morning is to help you. I'm taking for me because if you, y'all had a bottom hill, would have beat the hell out of me tonight. <laughs> I really want to appreciate that. Now, who would like to come up here and cheat these other people out of a, you know, on their free weekend? Who would like to draw these tickets this morning? Hello, my name is Jeannie Klein. I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad you all are here. Uh, would those who care to help me open this meeting with a serenity prayer? God. Is Ed W. from Stevenson, Stevenson, Virginia, and uh, I haven't had the opportunity of hearing him before, but I look forward to hearing him share his experience, strength, and hope. And would you help me welcome him? Jenny, for that uh, brief introduction. I appreciate it. One time I was speaking at a meeting where the chairperson had heard my tape, and in the course of introducing me, he said, uh, this is a speaker I really want you to hear. I have heard his tape, and there's some things about him that I really enjoyed. And then he proceeded to tell everybody all my best material. And uh, by the time I got up, I, all I could do was thank him and say, you know, that's the guy I am, and that's it. I, I also want to thank you, Jeannie, for that vote of confidence of, of using your very, very valuable lottery win to buy a tape without hearing in advance what you're going to get. That, that, made, that made me feel very good. I'm very impressed with that lottery. I hope, has every committee member won something now? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I certainly hope so. And uh, I thought there should be one extra prize, and that is they should have had a bookcase for Wayne so he could take his library home. <laughs> that lottery reminds me of, uh, of uh, 
the Irishman that uh, ran into the Monsignor on the Sunday morning after the, after the parish uh, carnival and raffle. And he said to the Monsignor, he says, well, how did the carnival and raffle go, Monsignor? And he said to him, well, he said it was a, an amazing thing. He said it was the most successful one we've ever had. He says, as to the raffle, he says it was really, truly a, a, just an incredible coincidence of events. He says, now, you know the color television set. He says, yes, Monsignor, I know the color television set. Would you believe it was won by Sister Bridget over in the convent? Wasn't she the lucky one? He says, oh, yes, Monsignor, he, she was certainly a lucky one. He said, and you know the trip to Florida for, the, for two weeks in Florida. Would you believe it? He says, Father Donovan, my assistant, won that. Now, wasn't he the lucky one? And he says, oh, he certainly was, Monsignor. He says, tell me what happened to the Cadillac car. He says, well, I'm sort of embarrassed to say. He says, but would you believe that I won it myself? Wasn't I the lucky one? And he says, yes, you certainly were, Monsignor. And the Monsignor looked at him and said, tell me, Tim, how many raffle books did you buy? He said, not a damn one. Wasn't I the lucky one? <laughs> this has been a truly wonderful and, and, and enjoyable weekend for me and for Kara. Uh, you folks, from the minute we arrived here, were just warm and, and great and not unexpectedly, just like everyone else I've ever met in AA, uh, friends waiting to get together. Uh, we start off a little inauspiciously because when we got here and parked the car and uh, went in the register and came back out to move the car, the battery was dead. And Tara, who does the worrying for both of us, uh, said, uh, God, will we ever be able to get the car started? And I said, don't worry, honey, a gathering of AAs like this will contain at least 20 mechanics and 10 car thieves. <laughs> I said, we AAs have no problem getting cars started once we find them. <laughs> and sure enough, Saturday morning, Rusty and, and Fred got me, helped me get a new battery put in the car. And I'm not going to say which category Rusty and Fred fall into. <laughs> It's been a marvelous uh, opportunity to hear people share. I've enjoyed the speakers up to now, all of them. Uh, I certainly enjoyed Mike, and I enjoyed Tom's talk last night. And as to that other talk yesterday morning, um, I think uh, I have to say that I truly enjoyed that. Hearing Kara share her story. Wait, I'm not finished yet. You won't. Hearing Kara share her story is, for me, sort of like listening to Mozart while having a root canal. <laughs> I particularly love the reception that she gets from the Al-Anons in the room because I was told one time by an Al-Anon that what they really like most about Kara is she did all the things they wanted to do. <laughs> Now, I said to somebody, today is Paul Harvey time. You can have the rest of the story. And uh, the rest of the story really is pretty much the same. I will say this, though. The, the, the infamous uh, frying pan episode, the skillet episode, that cast iron skillet that uh, she cracked a couple of my ribs with, uh, was, uh, and as she mentioned, was broken when it landed on the floor. When she told that story at an Al-Anon convention in Georgia, on the last day of the convention, I really know how sadistic you people can be, because on the last day of the convention, when they were wrapping it up, the chairperson called her up on stage, and as a gift from the Georgia Al-Anons in a beautifully, of course, you know Al-Anons, magnificently wrapped box, was a brand new cast iron skillet. <laughs> So uh, that's known as the weapon of choice, I guess, in Georgia Allen. <laughs> Being here this weekend gave me an opportunity to refresh personally and spiritually, and most importantly, to enjoy something that has been so, so vital to me, and that is the fellowship of people who know how to live and know the joy of living. And that's what I want to touch on a little bit today, because that's what we're entitled to, and that's what we practice so well at these roundups. 
Uh, there has been uh, other speakers who shared something of their childhood. I will try and share some of that because it is somewhat material in my story. Uh, I grew up in a uh, home just about 20 miles north of New York City. I was born in New York City, and I grew up in Westchester County. My father was an alcoholic and a stockbroker, and that's a really pretty good combination. Of course, Bill Wilson was one of those too, but unfortunately for my father, it didn't turn out the same way. That meant, in effect, that we were on an emotional and financial roller coaster ride most of my life. He made big money and lost big money. And in between, he drank big and he tapered off and he drank big again. And, and there was a lot of chaos in that, in that surrounding. Uh, the financial part I'm reminded of uh, because, uh, just an example, we joined and resigned from the same country club five times in my youth. If he had money, he joined the country club. When he couldn't pay the bills, he resigned, and he joined again. Now, that would have been turmoil to a young person, except my sister and I were the two best swimmers in that country club, so we never lost our pool privileges no matter what happened. We, they never let us quit because we, we anchored the swimming team. My father would have to then drink off his buddies in the bar until he could be a member again and get back in again. But it wasn't what you would call a, 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 an oppressive home or anything else. They, my mother and father tried very much to extend a great deal of love to us to the best of their ability. But it was a chaotic home. Uh, I had a lot of alcoholic aunts and uncles. I saw a lot of drunkenness and a lot of, uh, of, the, of the things that go with it. There were uh, uncles that were killed in car accidents and all sorts of things like that. So my exposure to alcohol at an early age was one in which there were a lot of serious consequences when people drank too much. And so the image to me of drinking was you've got to be able to hold your liquor. That's the most important thing. And that there was something uh, that I saw in these relatives of mine that they just didn't seem to be able to hold their liquor. And when the time came for me to have my liquor, I was going to make sure that I didn't do those kinds of things. Uh, I, liquor was always there. As Kara told you, the, uh, the typical scene in our kitchen was a bottle of, of, uh, of whiskey on the table with jelly glasses no matter what time of day or night it was. And the economic barometer, the Dow Jones average in our house, was what label was on that bo bottle. Because if it was, if we were in a bull market, it was like Hagen Hague pinch, and if we were in a downturn in the market, a depression in the stock market, it was something like Guggenheimer's double X Y or something. So you could really tell how the family finances were going by what what brands were were being put out on that on that table. For me, growing up was a, a very interesting and exciting experience because one of the things that God gave me was a very good brain. And uh, that seemed to give me my identity. I uh, uh, went to a Catholic school uh, that was very high on education, and I was number one in my class from the day I arrived there. And I was the model kid. I was the one that everybody looked up to. I was the, cl the school and the class brain. I attracted the, tr uh, the attention of the pastor early on and started studying Latin in the third grade. He had me on what you might call the archbishop track. Uh, I think he had grand ideas for me. And I stayed that way, and I did everything that was expected of me. I was the oldest of six, and it was important for me to do things right and, and be good and not get in trouble and study hard and do very, very well. And I did that. And, and to the degree, and I just say this because it's important to my story, uh, I would never want, and my own kids never went through this experience, believe me, by a long shot. But I was so successful that, that I, when I was in eighth grade, I won like every competition for the entire Archdiocese of New York, which is, you know, 50, 60, 100,000 kids in schools. And I won the essay contest for the Archdiocese. I won the Christian Doctrine competition. I was on a radio show called Whiz Kids. And all this, this stuff, it was very heady thing, and, every, and my parents took a great deal of pride, needless to say, in the accomplishments of Eddie. I hate that name. Uh, but uh, Eddie, Eddie was the, the super superstar. And Eddie, somehow or other, there was something not right about this. And, and when I finished high school in, West, in grammar school in Westchester County, I was awarded a scholarship 
to a very prestigious, academically prestigious high school in New York where the brightest, and the best and the brightest from all the Catholic schools went. And I would commute every morning, 6.30 in the morning on a, on a commuter train with the regular commuters at the age of 13 in New York, get off the train in Harlem where I wouldn't get off today on a bet, but we and get on a subway and go to that high school and then go to do my studies and, and come home. Well, at that point in my life, at 13, 14, so on, in, in New York City, I was discovering the wonders of, of this big metropolis. I was free to come and go as I wanted. I learned where those subways would take you. I found the ballparks. I found everything you could find. And I was having a ball. And because I'd never really been challenged in grammar school, I just thought that, that the studies would come along with it. And the studies didn't come along with it. And at the end of my second year in that high school, they thought that maybe I didn't belong there, and they dropped me out. And that was like the bottom falling out of my life, because I had it, the letter came in the mail, and my pet mother looked at it, and she burst into tears, and my father walked out of the room. And, you know, here this up till now marvelously bright, capable kid had literally disgraced the family. How are we going to tell the Monsignor? What is sister going to say? You know... And all I had done was just gotten 74 in Latin and 74 in geometry and 74 in French. And passing grade was 75. They were sending me a little message that they just, I wasn't bad, but they just didn't want me. And I was literally left on my own. You made your bed, you lie in it. And it was a major change in, in, in I think, at that point in my personality because, okay, if all I mean to you is getting these grades and accomplishments and awards, then, uh, you know, the hell with you. I'll go do it my way. I'll take care of myself. But I still had that ambition to succeed and to be, to, to, uh, to be successful and to be recognized. And so I went off to, it was a brand new high school that had opened a year before, and I went off there and I con convinced them that I should be enrolled and without losing a year in school into their, what would be their first uh, graduating class. And I, I fit in well. I now had friends. I really didn't have this pressure on me. Nobody was looking at me over my shoulders. And it was a great crowd. And it was my own neighborhood people from the towns around me. And we partied. And I found out at that time, boy, that they'd had another talent that could be easily recognized and far more appreciated by his peers than his scholarship in Latin, and that was my hollow leg. And so I became the person that literally could take care of everybody when we went drinking, and we went drinking pretty regularly. It was important for me, though, because that I never get drunk. Tom talked about last night that each time he picked up a drink, it was with the full intent of going all the way until he was horizontally, uh, until he was, what was it, involuntarily horizontal. Uh, mine was just the opposite. Mine was to be part of it, enjoy it, be in the center of it, but make damn sure you do not ever look like your uncles or your aunts or your father. So I was a controlled drinker from the very, very beginning and I was very successful at it. Uh, and, uh, and everybody who knew me then knew me as a person that was okay. Ed could do the driving, Ed could do all this sort of stuff. And I went from that high school where, by the way, I graduated not first in my class, but with awards for having contributed the most to the school. I had started the school paper. I had done everything you could imagine and, and went off to had college scholarships offered to me. So basically, I was back on the right track from the standpoint of the things you're supposed to do. And I went off to college, and uh, college was a ball. It was just a ball. I grew up in New York, and the drinking age in New York was 18, which meant you started somewhere around 14, and you could really do your bar drinking started about 16. And I went to college in Massachusetts, where the drinking age at that time was 21, and most of my classmates in college had not had any real real life experience of drinking in bars. They didn't know how to do it. They were, you know, so I taught a lot of them. Uh, I also taught a lot of them to play cards. I also taught a lot of them to shoot crap. I also taught, you know, I had very valuable lessons to give to my classmates. And uh, so college was wonderful. And, uh, and I had a good time and had made good friends. 
and I did good things. And I was involved in this, Kara mentioned yesterday, the newspaper, and I got involved with the sports department and ended up doing broadcasting for them. And, and so I, college was a, was a great period of time. Uh, along with college came Kara, and uh, basically, and this is an honest program, Kara was a marvelous convenience. As she said, she wasn't exactly the trim, good-looking girl she was is now. Uh, she was a little heavy set. She didn't know a hell of a lot about men, and she was always there. And uh, and she was very, very bright, and very, very bright. And she typed, and that was important because she could take care of papers and stuff like that for me while I played bridge with her friends and and had a good time. So we got we went through college, and we were good friends, and we did a lot of things like that. Uh, when we got out of college, I went into the advertising business as a writer in a Madison Avenue, and I found myself in another whole world of excitement, and um, uh, right in the center of the cultural changes that were going on in the, in the early uh, and mid-50s, and the, the real outburst and growth of television, and uh, started writing commercials and ads and so on, and getting involved in, in broadcasts, and, and it, it was heady stuff. We got married. It was heady, except for one thing: they didn't pay you, and um, and it was and I was really, you know, just not making much money. I was making fifty bucks a week, and when we decided to get married, the company had a policy that a person who was married got a ten dollar a week raise. Now, you tell me anybody can keep a wife on ten bucks a week? I don't know, but that was their attitude. So I got a raise to sixty bucks, and we got married. And um, so we didn't have a lot of money to do a lot of drinking, or I didn't have an uh, opportunity to do a lot of drinking. And I'm very, very grateful for that because uh, we had children in good Catholic tradition, one right after another, uh, uh, four of them in less than five years. And, uh, and we did, as Kara say, have some medical problems with them and, and other things that all turned out beautifully uh, by the grace of God. But we. We live simply, but unfortunately, my success drive uh, brought with it financial gain, and uh, and I got a lot of responsibility, which I exercised well, and got a lot of recognition for it, got a lot of promotions. And at the age of 32, I was a vice president of the largest advertising agency in the world. And at that point, we were in the big, we were on the fast track. We did belong to the the country club in in one of the most affluent suburbs of New York, Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, I was traveling and, and, and moving in circles that I don't care to say about now, but they were, they were who's who in America in politics and show business and so on. And knew them all, drank with them all, had a wonderful time, and, and was very, very recognizable in that era. The company, although I was never one that showed that I couldn't hold liquor, certainly knew that I was one that had an affinity for it and was comfortable around it because they assigned me uh, the advertising accounts of companies like National Distillers and Rheingold Breweries and why General Cigar, I don't know, but, uh, but we ha I had those kind of clients. Uh, my good friends from north of the border, I was even sent as a consultant to our Montreal office to help uh, acquire the Melcher's distillery account. So I have had drunk, drunk Al Cool in some of the worst French-Canadian bars you can imagine, and so on. And uh, so somehow or other, people did know that I had a, some sort of a, a, a very special talent in that area. Uh, the drinking progressed, and as it did, so became the early incipient stages of, of alcoholism. And things started to happen that I never expected to happen. And things that I said I would never tolerate in my life or allow to happen, I suddenly started to accept. One in particular that was very, uh, very emotional and traumatic was that on my birthday, which happens to be in June, in broad daylight at 6.30 at night, I got off my commuter train where I had been drinking on the train, which I, we normally did, but I had also been drinking since noon because it was my birthday and I had gone out with some people and never come back from lunch. And I walked past my brother-in-law and two or three neighbors who all thought at the time, God, Ed shouldn't be driving, but Ed did drive. And Ed sideswiped two cars on his own street. 
and drove his banged up car into the front yard trying to get there, get home before the cops came and walked in the house where the kids had the birthday presents on the table and the cake laid out and just said to Kara as I walked in the door, get my lawyer on the phone, I'm in trouble. And I got through that scrape and thought back on it and said, you know, is something wrong with your drinking? And the answer was, hell no, it was your birthday. You're entitled to once in a while on your birthday, you can get drunk. But things like birthdays started to happen a little bit more often. And we started to have a little difficulty at home in terms of this because somehow or other Kara didn't like some of these things that were happening. And um, uh, I started to play the honey, the problem with you game is that, that Tom described so well last night. Even to the point that uh, at one point she went to a psychologist for some help and um, uh, she went to a couple of sessions and the psychologist said, well, get him in here and we'll see what we can do. Uh, and um, I very graciously said, I think that's a wonderful idea. I ought to go see your psychologist. And I went in and saw her psychologist. Well, I'm pretty fast study as, you know, as a salesperson and so on. And I walked in the psychologist's office and I knew this guy was not living the way he'd like to live. This was a rather tacky, shabby, third-class psychologist office. I had been in some elite New York psychologist office, and this was not the way big-time psychologists do. But I sensed that this man would like to do better if he could. And so I immediately established with him the fact that I was a very wealthy person. And, um, and then the second thing I established with him was that I doubted that my wife had described the true story of her problem, which was basically she had this close tie to her father, and she really thought she should marry a mirror image of her father, and her father and I could never be the same, and that really the problem was that I could never live up to her predetermined image of, of what a husband should be, like her father. She's in therapy now because of her father more than she is about me. But she, but I convinced him that this was the real source of her problem and that I knew, and I knew the magic words, that this was a long-term therapy problem to be worked on. And I wanted to assure him that he had my un total support and confidence and to keep her in therapy for as long as he felt he needed to. And thank you very much and goodbye. And immediately when she went back in, the therapist explained that we ought to start working on your relationship with your father and leave that wonderful man alone. And, um, but uh, uh, there were some other things that happened that made it so that she wasn't about to leave that wonderful man alone, and, and she wasn't very happy. Uh, and that really wouldn't have mattered to me, but what started to happen to me was that the, that the early stages of this, that the loss of interest in my work, the lack of ambition, the longer lunch hours, the selection of luncheon companions. I only went, up, went to lunch with, with salespeople that would drink. I didn't want to be with ones who didn't. I had my own cadre of friends in the, in the company, in the agency that drank like I did. I had a boss who drank worse than I did, which made it absolutely wonderful, except for one thing. He used to like to get in fights. And I would have to fight, take, you know, fight our way out of bars. And I was a lover, not a fighter, so it didn't, you know, it was really kind of unnerving. But he and I would stay out all night, and we had good time. We did. A, we were reminded recently. I, re, I was at a, a convention, and I ran into a woman from from uh, Bermuda, and I I laughed, and I said, "Oh yeah, I was locked up in Bermuda once in a tuxedo." And uh, she thought that was kind of amusing, but that's what happened. We went to a convention, went to a black tie dinner, got bored with it, went out on the town and ended up in jail in Bermuda in tuxedos. And, and, um, and, it, and it was really kind of distinctive, you know, to be in, in a tuxedo in jail. I've been in jail without tuxedos, but I, that was the only time I ever was informal, you know. Uh, but, um, and you get a lot more respect, by the way, if you're ever thinking of it. You do get a lot more respect if you're in a tuxedo. Uh, but they... Um, uh, uh, things like that were happening, and, and my and next thing I knew, career-wise, people that were working for me were getting promoted above me, and others on that thing. And my career was at a standstill, and I was frustrated. And and besides that, I wanted more money because I was spending more money, and things were getting tight. Despite no matter how much you had, it didn't make any difference. Uh, 
And so I talked to a couple of friends of mine in another company who used to work with me and asked them if they had a good job for me. And they said that they had a job, but they doubted I'd take it because it would mean moving from New York out to Ohio. And, um, and I said, where in Ohio? And they said, Dayton, Ohio. And I said, oh, hell, I might be interested in going to Dayton. I knew one thing about Dayton. It was marvelous. I mean, this is how you make career decisions, right? This is great. I had gone to Dayton, Ohio once. I had brought a proposal from our company out to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to handle the Air Force recruiting account. And I had completed my business at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the plane didn't go back to New York till 6. And uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is in Fairborn, which is about 15 miles outside of downtown Dayton. And I stepped out in front of the, the, the building that I was in and uh, asked them to get me a taxi cab. And I got in a taxi cab, and I said to the taxi driver, take me to where the businessmen have lunch and drink. So they took me to this absolutely magnificent restaurant called the King Cole with beautiful paintings on the wall and beautifully carpeted, gorgeous restaurant. Didn't expect to find anything like it. Gourmet food in this place in Dayton, Ohio. And I went into the bar and uh, there was a barman there by the name of, uh, of uh, George. And I introduced myself and I spent the afternoon in the King Cole bar and had a wonderful time. Called a taxi cab about four o'clock and they drove me out to the airport and I came home. So when they told me Dayton, Ohio, I said, hell of a place to go, you know? I mean, I know I could be happy in Dayton, Ohio. They had the most important thing I needed, which was the King Cole Bar, and I didn't even know any more about it. So I came home that night and told Carrot I thought we were going to move to Dayton, Ohio. And she said um, she'd be glad to go. She'd go to Alaska if it would get me off the bar car and away from my friends. And I told her how wonderful it was going to be because we're going to be in the heartland of America where people come home for dinner at reasonable hours, and where you, you bring up your kids in the great outdoors, and I mean, you know this story, it was gorgeous. And this is what we did, and I honestly thought that that might take place. So we moved to Dayton. Well, what happened was I moved to Dayton. She couldn't move for four or five months till the kids were out of school. So the company put me up, I had an apartment, bachelor pad, really nice place, furnished and everything else, and I had about three or four months to, to really get acclimated to the community without her around. Well, what I was doing was going out there as senior vice president of this company, and I was handling the advertising for the Frigid Air Company, which was then part of General Motors, and it was the, one of the biggest employers in town. I had an office with a staff of about 30 people who were looking up to me, and the, part of the reason they gave me this job was that the previous general manager was a stiff and a square and a prude, and he didn't have any fun. And these clients at Frigidaire wanted somebody they could have fun with. They wanted to work hard and they wanted to play hard, and I was the ideal person. So I was put in this office in a situation that enabled me uh, to make sure everybody had a good time. I had a monstrous liquor closet in the back of my desk. I had a full kitchen, you know, with all the ice I needed. I, had a, on, I was on the 21st floor of the building. There was a neat bar on the first floor, and there was a, a private club on the, on the top floor, the 32nd floor, of which I was a member. I was also made a member of the country club, and I had an expense account that I signed. And this, you know, God, you know, I see people salivating right now. I can just tell you, it is a drunk's paradise. And four months to get used to it without your old lady around. I mean, you know, this is great. Well, it took me about a week before the first cop pulled me over. And, um, and when he did, I, this was great because my picture had just appeared in the paper as this big new time executive coming into town. Well, he, was, he wasn't a cop, he was a bloody welcome wagon. I mean, he tells me, you know, how glad they are to have me here. And then after he got finished all this stuff and how much responsibility I would have leading this office, that he hoped that I really would try to go easy on the drinking and he would follow me back to my apartment and so on. And I said, this is a nice place. I mean, you know, they escort you home and, you know, like, well, the second cop wasn't so friendly and um, I was in jail. But, they, uh, but the, 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 the situation was such that I thought this was going to be, be great. And what I didn't know, and we all know, was that I brought me with it, with this, with this change, and I brought my disease with me, and it was now free to run its course. 
The people I drank with and worked with in that company, it was one tragedy after another. If I ever had to see what alcoholism can do, we had one man who plowed into a, into a telephone pole and was killed. And we all spent a lot of time concocting a story for the insurance people to try and prove that he had a heart attack before the car hit the, the telephone pole so that the double indemnity would kick in and nothing. I went to the wake and the funeral of a young man who was a client of mine. And I, I mean, you couldn't picture a worse situation to be at this, this wake and this funeral of a young man with a pretty young wife and two small kids knowing that this guy died when he went through the ice on a snowmobile drunk up in Wisconsin with a 17-year-old girl on the back of the snowmobile, you know. And that was going on around me. Uh, and I was oblivious to it. And I, as I said, I got my share of DWIs and got out of them because I got high-priced lawyers and convinced them of this, that, and the other thing and, and did all this stuff. Home life, when Kara finally got there, the first year she was so wrapped up with the kids that it was, uh, it was impossible to pay attention to me. And so it, it, by the time she, she turned around and looked at me, I was really far, far gone. At this point, the physical aspects of this illness were taking over. I was starting to get the shakes. Uh, I was starting to have blackouts. I was running extremely high blood pressure. I was having chronic nosebleeds, all the kind of physical symptoms that can come with this illness. Uh, I can remember the very the one morning that I got up shaking like a leaf, and I went down into the kitchen, and there was a wet bar at one side of the kitchen and the regular kitchen, and I walked over to the refrigerator, and I got some orange juice out, and I kept looking at this bottle of vodka over on the wet bar, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I shook, and I walked over that wet bar, and I was all alone in that kitchen, and I grabbed that bottle of vodka, and I poured it into the orange juice, and took a swig, and said, shit, you're a drunk like your father. I knew at that moment that I was an alcoholic. I mean, I had plenty of reason to believe it up to then, but the moment of truth had arrived. I could not get to work without that drink. And when I got to work, I started to drink as soon as I got in. It was kind of crazy. I had this... Uh, opaque Cincinnati Reds beer mug that I'd walk around the office filled with iced tea and bourbon. I mean, like I was fooling anybody all day long. But my staff would do anything to enable. It was, it was incredible, and they did. However, they couldn't do it long enough, and my physical problems got worse and worse and worse. The blackouts got worse and worse and worse. I completely forgot that the executive vice president of the company had been in town with me for three days during which I must have functioned and and he was barely back in the office in New York when I called him on the phone and started giving him all sorts of babble about what was going on out here and he looked at he said in the phone he said what are you telling me this for and I said because I thought you ought to know and he said hell you told me all this last night in my hotel room in Dayton and I didn't even remember that he had been there so he got on a plane came out and fired my ass but he didn't. But he didn't. I'm in the employee assistance field now, working with companies to help troubled employees. And I'm in that field today because of what happened at that moment, because of what might have changed the course of, of my life a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. When he got out there, he didn't know what to do with a high officer of the company who was a, a, you know, a, a, a late-stage alcoholic. He had no resources to utilize, to turn to, to help him in that case. And so what he did was instead of saying something like, Ed, we're kicking your butt out of here because you're a fall down drunk and can't do the job, or saying, better yet, Ed, we believe you have an illness and we want you to get some help and we want you to get it, he did the middle thing, which was to say, top of the cop a plea and say, Ed, you're the greatest thing that ever came down the pike. You're bright, you're wonderful, you're capable, we love you, but unfortunately you're the victim of client politics. They want new blood on this account. And being as fact as half of them had died off, uh, I could understand that. And they had made a lot of changes in that company. And he said, we have to bring a new team in. But the bad part is we haven't got another place for somebody of your level and your capacity. So what we want to do is give you this 
severance arrangement and we're going to buy your stock back and we're going to take care of you and we'll recommend you to anybody else that'll have you uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and give you our best wishes and our regrets. Well, what he did was cut me loose with all the things I needed to finish the job. I had a super resentment. I was a victim. I had been done wrong. I had some money and I had time on my hands. Well, thank God one aspect of the money uh, worked out to keep the family somewhat together, and that was Kara got hold of it and uh, uh, before I did. When they sent the check for the stock and the severance thing, she got a hold of it, and she put it in our bank account, our savings account. Uh, unfortunately, to this day, I still don't know what bank that savings account was in. <laughs> I know there's none of it left, I can guarantee you that. And there wasn't, because for the next two years I was not to work again. For the next two years I was to pursue the course downhill of alcoholism, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I will not, because you've all been there, go through the details of it, but I will tell you where it ended up. It ended up at a point where she and I couldn't be in the same room together, almost the same house. It ended up where she did throw frying pans, where she did try to kill me on various occasions. When she talked about beating me yesterday, it was kind of funny because she didn't quite give you the full picture of it. What would happen would be that it would be my, my bent, that I would drink as much as I could wherever I could, and get home, and my object was to get from the door to the bed without being intercepted. And uh, so when somebody said, how did she ever push you up the stairs? She really wasn't pushing. I was running, and she was trying to get me, you know. <laughs> and soon as I would hit that bed and be prone, I would pass out. It was a, it was a self-preservation thing. If I was out, I didn't have to hear her. And um, she could really yell. See, she was a school teacher, and she doesn't need microphones. And, um, and so she would go at me. Well, as soon as I would pass out and she didn't have an audience, that would frustrate her. So then she'd reach down and grab her spike heel shoes and start using my body like a xylophone and whipping the hell out of them with the spike heels. I would come two hours later with bruises all over my torso, I'd look at myself in a mirror, and she'd look at me and say, well, if you didn't fall off those damn bar stools, you wouldn't look that way. <laughs> and I would say to myself, how did she know I just fell off a bar stool? <laughs> and so she would get a, you know, the battered shelter didn't have me that night, you know. So, but I mean, that was the chaos in our homes. It was awful on the kids. It was horrible, screaming, yelling, cursing, swearing, fighting, and so on. And they couldn't bring their friends around, and you all know that story, too, and the, and the damage that is done to the, to the young people, particularly in teenagers trying to establish uh, connections with friends in a social life, and so on. And then it reached that awful stage when she couldn't take it anymore, and she went back to Connecticut to tell her parents that this was it, that she had to admit that she was married to an alcoholic, and that she was going to divorce him. And when she ran into the priest up there, Vinnie O'Connor, who has gone on to sainthood, believe me, by now, turned her around and sent her back to Al-Anon, our lives changed. I make a lot of jokes, as all of us drunks do, about Al-Anon, but Al-Anon saved my life. There's no question about it. It served, saved it in a rather unusual and unique and different and not quite the way I had it planned. But there was one major thing that Al-Anon did. It saved my life because somehow or other, when she went to Al-Anon, they told her that it wasn't consistent with the program of Al-Anon to hit him with skillets, to sit on his face with a pillow, and to beat him with your shoes. And so I immediately felt a sense of security. And... And for this, dear Al-Anon, and Lois Wilson, wherever you are up there, I am eternally grateful. <laughs> uh, 
I think it's ironic that Lois started Al-Anon because she got so pissed off at Bill, she threw a shoe at him, too. Did you ever think of that? Yeah. At any rate, the other thing that happened with Al-Anon was there was quiet in the house. She didn't yell at me. She didn't talk to me, but she didn't yell at me. And that was great. So I sort of felt this false sense of security. Now, there were some suspicious things happening. A blue book appeared in the house. And it was placed on a table. And believe me, I may have been a drunk, but, you know, once you're trained like a CIA agent or something, you get used to everything. You read enough spy novels. You know, you don't, you don't pick up something because there might be a little thread attached to it, and they can tell whether you've picked it up, you know. And I would see the dust pattern around that book where it was left for me. So if I picked it up, I had to put it back exactly the way it was, lest she think that I had even looked at it. But I did look at it. And I did read the big book. Well, I read one chapter. I read a chapter called Two Wives. I mean, I'm no dummy. I want the game plan. I mean, I want to know what they're telling her to do to me. Now, you know something? You may laugh, guys and gals in the program, but the chapter Two Wives is probably the most devastating chapter we can read. Think about it. If you haven't read it in a long time, read it again. Because it's in the chapter to wives that somehow or other they described all the categories of alcoholics, right? In the front part where they're talking to the drunks, they're very low-key. You may have this problem if this is you, right? But in to the wives, they say, here's what a drunk looks like. A, class A, class B, class C, and so on. Well, hell, I was in the highest heaven of drunks. I mean, I fit the worst category. That was very disturbing because they somebody had been watching me and they knew about me. Well, I put it down. I said, I got to be very, very careful of these people. They know too much. And I went about my business. And it wasn't easy, by the way, because I had a very difficult time keeping my habit going and doing this drinking without any money, without any income. I mean, I was literally on an allowance. And I had to do various things of which I, you know, resources did. I would lie, I would steal, I would extort money. My favorite extortion method would be to just write a check in a bar, have the check bounce, Kara pick up the mail, she knew what those bounce checks looked like, and then go to her and she'd yell at me about the check and I'd say, oh God, I'm in real trouble now. Those guys know where I live and they're going to come for the kids. I got to have the money to cover that check. And she would give me the money. I'm not giving, everybody in this room has been sober long enough. I'm not giving you any new tips. But, uh, but, and, but she'd come up with the money and I would go pay it off and then I'd write another check in another bar. Or I would steal money from my son, who was at that time about 14 or 15 and ran lawnmowers all over town and all around and had saved up his money and he'd put it, bring it home innocently and put it on his dresser. As soon as it was there, I'd grab it and go off and drink. And I'm ashamed about that, but I'll tell you about that a little later. At any rate, it was tough, but I kept it up. I also kept up this crazy appearance thing, and I think Tom alluded to that too. I don't know whether it was grandiosity that made me do this, but it was something that I had to hang on to the fact that I was still okay. And the insanity of this was that I had to drink basically around the clock. And when you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you need a drink, and you can't drink in your own home, and you want to get out before your wife gets up at 6 and goes off to school, you know, the op bar options are not too, too many. But in Dayton was a factory town with three shift operations, so you could find a bar open any hour, day or night. So I would go to this bar over where the big Delco plant let out third shift, and it was open at about 5 o'clock in the morning. But I didn't want to be like those guys. So I would put on a jacket and tie at 4 o'clock, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, go into that bar with the newspaper, which would have been delivered by that time, under my arm, and I gave them this big cover story that I was the night editor of the local newspaper and I just got off work. Because it was okay to drink when you got off work. That's cocktail hour, right? So, uh, so I would come in with my tie on and then I'd step up that bar and I'd put, I'm dating myself, but I'd put a buck down and they'd pour me a, 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 a short, uh, a, high, a, a rocks glass full of scotch 
and then I would take both hands and wait when nobody was looking and try and get it up to my face or my face down at that glass and get it down and then it would hit the bottom and I'd head out the door to the parking lot, throw it up, come back, put the second buck down and get the second one and that would use may or may not stay if it didn't the third one always did and the day was off and running it was wonderful and then i could move from bar to bar and i'd gradually shed my jacket and tie and be one of the guys and then about two or three two o'clock in the afternoon i'd have run out come home got home before she did pass out on the bed and do it and uh, so during this time it was getting worse and worse and i was going downhill physically and every other way uh, Finally, that stopped. Kara had passed certain exams in Al Anon and, uh, <laughs> and had reached the stage where she was allowed to deliver that fateful message that you get empowered to deliver if you go to enough meetings and your sponsor says you're ready to. And she came home and she started the message, and I think you all know how it starts. It starts, honey, I love you, but, right? It's written, it's engraved there somewhere. Okay. Honey, I love you, but, and then it goes on with the fact is, I, but I will not stay by and watch you kill yourself with alcohol and wreck this family and boom, boom, boom. You have an illness. If you want to get some help for this illness, there's help there for you. You either accept it or, and I was waiting for the punchline, which was I'm leaving and going home to mother, which would have been okay with me. But she didn't. Somebody rewrote the ending and said, if you don't, you're out of this house. And I said, ooh, out where? I don't have any money. I got to get it from her or from John. I don't have any place to go. And she can throw me out of this house because there were seven judges in Montgomery County, Ohio, and I got drunk with every one of them. And they all knew me, and they all would have thrown my ass out in one second if she asked them to. So I said, well, what do I have to do? And she said, go to Alcoholics Anonymous. The operable verb was go. That was it. So I went. Every single week I went, once a week, whether I needed it or not. <laughs> there was nothing ever said to me about not drinking. And so I would arrive at the meeting. We would go together because there was an Al-Anon meeting in the same building. And I would arrive at the meeting and my brown bag would be under the front seat of the car and I would say, you go in, because she always had this eight crazy idea that she had to be early, had to set up, had to talk to people. Well, I ain't going early. I'm going to sit here and listen to the ball game. And so in the middle of July and August, I'd sit in the parking lot of the church with the engine running, the air conditioning going, the windows up, the doors locked, my brown bag in my hand, and listen to the baseball game, waiting for 8 o'clock to hit. And then I'd bolt into the meeting before they took attendance or whatever they did. And, and attend the meeting. Well, the meetings were great, okay? Because you're talking about, it was a step discussion group. Now, these steps were right up my alley. You gotta understand, I'm a guy who studied philosophy and theology and all these wonderful things. I'm an expert on this stuff. And I made you know it. I, I could tell you where the root of all these steps was in, in Aristotelian philosophy or to mystic philosophy and so I mean you guys they just loved it I mean I know they just loved it in fact a friend of mine who moved there from New York went to his first meeting in that group and told me later he called his, his sponsor back in New York and and he said to his sponsor who was a New York cop he says Pat I can't stay sober in Dayton Ohio they got drunks leading the meeting you know <laughs> And then that meeting would mercifully end with the Lord's Prayer, and you couldn't catch me going down those stairs if you were, you know, Edmund Moses. I don't care. I was gone. Back into my car, locked the doors, turned the thing on. I'd wave at you as you'd leave. And Kara would look out the window, and, and i got to tell you truthfully, I never let an AA meeting interfere with my drink. I never let it happen, and I never drank in a meeting, okay? But I went... I, Kara would look out the window and see me sitting there in that car and she'd cry and she'd cry and her sponsor said, I've got to leave them, I can't handle it. And her sponsor, this wonderful, warm, beautiful woman in Virginia, would put her arm around her and say, honey, you don't want to leave him now, he's coming along beautifully. <laughs> I came along beautifully, but I went too far. By 
December of 1977, I was no longer able to attend those meetings. In January, I was trying somehow or other to stop drinking, and each time I did, I would go into DTs and have just the most god-awful withdrawals, and then I'd go drink again, and, and I mean every single day, around the clock, two hours, day or night. I didn't eat for like a month and a half. I was down, my weight was completely gone. I was turning an awful color of green. Kara looked at it, knew there was nothing she left that she wanted to do. Her dad was ill and in Florida. She went where she was needed, where she could do something. And I was left basically home in Ohio to die. I was left home and the insanity of it was I was alone in a two-story house. And in, in some vague part of my head, I was trying to be normal. So I would try to sleep in my bed in the bedroom on the second floor. At the same time, all alone in that house, I hid my liquor behind the bookcase in a library on the first floor. And when I needed a drink, I would get out of bed and I would have to crawl down those stairs because I could no longer walk. I was so sick. And I would crawl down the stairs and into that library and prop myself up and find that bottle and open it up and take a swig and put the cork the top back on it, hide it again, crawl back up the stairs and get into my bed and an hour later start to go into withdrawals and repeat the process and come down. On March the 9th, 1978, I made that trip for the last time. And when I took that bottle out from behind that bookcase and stood up and took that swig out of it, I fell over. And the bottle fell out of my hands and it started to roll across the floor and I tried to crawl after it. And I didn't have the strength to crawl. And I lay there on the floor and I watched the liquor flowing out of, the, out of that bottle and going down. And through my mind, I realized my whole life what had happened. I realized the devastation I had brought to everybody who loved me. I realized the disappointment I had been to my parents, to my schoolmates, to my employers. I realized that a life that started out with so much promise and so much hope and so much expectation had turned into a life that was destroying everyone that I held near and dear. And I wanted that life to end. And I cried out that night, God, God, get this over with quick. And that's the last thing I remember. Four days later, I regained consciousness in an intensive care unit. I had been in a coma for four days. When I came to, I said to this nurse who was getting kind of excited when I started to talk, how long have I been here? And she said, four days. And I said to her, you mean I have gone four whole days without a drink? And she looked at me kind of puzzled and said, yeah, you certainly have. And I said, that's wonderful. I had gone four whole days without a drink. I can go one more day without a drink. You see, in those meetings, I had heard you. I had heard you tell me we do this one day at a time. I had heard that that's how it works, but I had never been able to go one day at a time. When I finally got to you and heard you, I only could go two hours at a time. And so I didn't know how to go one day at a time. And for all my intelligence and for all those other things with me, I didn't know the first damn thing about detoxification from alcohol. And so I let you think I didn't want to get sober, but I wanted to in the worst way. I didn't know how to go about it. And I lay in that hospital room and I made a decision that morning, or whatever time it was, that I do not want to take a drink today. I made that decision this morning. I have made that decision every morning of my life from March 9th, 1978 until this morning. Because the magic of what took place that morning was I was restored to the power of choice. I have the choice of whether I want to drink again. And that to me was the most precious gift that God ever gave me, the ability to make that decision. And the only way I will ever lose that gift 
is if I choose to drink again. As long as I do not choose to drink, I do not have to worry about whether or not I will drink. But if I choose to drink again, I will have lost that power. I will have lost that control. I will have lost that ability. And that's the way I've done it ever since then. The second thing that happened to me in that bed was that I was very, very conscious of the fact that I had no business being there alive, that everything I had done to myself pointed towards death, and that my life had been saved, and it had been saved by a power beyond me. In my early life, yes, I was religious. In my early life, I had a beautiful relationship with God, but I had turned my back on God because I had replaced God. I had become God at that point when I took responsibility for my own life. I didn't need parents, and I didn't need priests, and I didn't need God. I was going to be the essence and the epitome of self-sufficiency, and that's what I had been up until that point. But now I desperately needed God. And God had stepped in in my desperation and saved my life and spared me. And the next thing that occurred to me as I lay in that bed was that he had done it for a purpose. That somewhere down that road there was some reason why he had chosen to let me live when my own preference was to die. And that if I did what I needed to do and stayed sober someday, I would find out what that reason was. And the next thing I knew was that I did not want to drink again. I wanted to find out what God had in store for me. But I was scared to death because I did not know the first thing about not drinking. And I didn't know anybody who knew anything about not drinking. People I had talked to in the past knew how to stay sober because they didn't get drunk. But I was a drunk and I didn't know how not to be one. And I knew, though, that there were some people on God's earth who did know about not drinking, and they were the people in the rooms that I had made fun of, in the rooms and the meeting tables of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I vowed if I ever got out of that hospital alive that that's where I would go and where I would stay, and thank God I was able to live up to that vow. I stayed in that hospital for the better part of a month by myself. No visitors, no nothing. I had plenty of time to think, and at one point I thought, well, I need to go back to AA, but I can't go back to AA because they won't have me. Because I made a joke and a mockery of their meetings, I went to them drunk, and I said stupid things, and they'll laugh at me, or probably worse, not even let me in. And I worried about that, and in my creeping gradual restoration of my grandiosity, I realized that I really didn't need to go to your meetings because I had your big book and I could teach myself this program, you know, like I could teach myself brain surgery. And one afternoon I woke up from a sleep and saw a beautiful young girl in my room. I recognized her, but I didn't know where I recognized her from. I thought she might have been a barmaid. That's where most beautiful young girls I had seen her. And she couldn't have been more than 18, 19 years of age. And she spoke to me and she called me by name and she said, how are you doing, Ed? And I said, I'm doing fine, thank you. And she said, are they taking good care of you? And I said, yes, they're just doing some tests on me. And she said, oh, that's good, are you going to be out soon? And I said, yes, soon. And she said, oh, that's good, hurry back, we miss you, and she left. And it took a day before I realized that that girl had sat at those tables at that meeting. And I recognized her and I said, they sent her. They want me. They're inviting me back. It's okay. And I felt relieved. On the last day I got out of that hospital, the doctor sent in a friend of his who was in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to talk to me. And he told me that he would take me to an AA meeting if I wanted to when I got out. And I said, when am I getting out? He said, you're getting out tomorrow if you want to go to an AA meeting. And then I'm taking you to your family. I said, I don't have a family anymore. He said, yes, you do. We know your family. They're ready for you. But first things first, you go to an AA meeting. And I went to that AA meeting and I don't remember anything about it except walking in the door and seeing in that meeting room a sign that I could read that said, hope is found here. And that is what I needed to see. And that's what I needed to hear. And that's what I needed to receive, hope. I was a physical wreck, folks. I went in that meeting on crutches, unable to walk on, on a on free. I was so mental, uh, so uh, uh, my brain was so uh, 
hurt. The brain cells had been so deteriorated from this chronic alcoholism that it was going to take me three months before I could dial a telephone. I could not carry a number in my head from here to the, to, to the finger to dial a telephone. I didn't know anything that was going on around me, but I knew I was in a safe place and I was loved. And I went home and I found the same kind of haven that Tara talked about, a f family of kids who through the pro program of, Al of Al Al-Anon understood what their father was going through and gave me that time and that space and that encouragement, that support to come back to life. And I was a cadaver and I was green and I was sick and I didn't know who I was and how I felt or anything. But I went every single morning, noon and night. There was that clubhouse that Kara described. It was a couple of miles away. She dropped me off at nine o'clock in the morning. I'd be there till noon. We had a meeting at 10, another conversation till noon. Somebody would drive me home. I'd get a sandwich, take a nap. She'd come home and talk. I'd be back at seven o'clock for the beginner's meeting, 8.30 for the regular meeting, home at 11. Did it day in, day out. Three months of intensive AA that way. At the end of three months, I was, was, got a telephone call. I felt secure in this group, and I felt for the first time in my life I was going to be okay, but I was still scared to death I'd drink again. And I got a telephone call from one of the old-timers in the program, and he said, Ed, there's something I want you to do. And I said, whatever. And he said, I want you to drive a friend of mine to Akron, Ohio. It's about a four-hour drive, four-and-a-half-hour drive from Dayton to Akron. And I had not been behind the wheel of a car at that point only maybe two weeks. I had started driving again. And I didn't, I was scared to death. And I was scared to death to leave town because my support group was right here. My AA group was here. And what am I going all the way to Akron? How am I going to stay sober up there in Akron? You know, I mean, this is, this is risky. And he said, Are you, we're going, you're going to Founders Day. Well, I didn't know what Founders Day was, but he said, you're going to take an old time friend of mine to Founders Day because we can't go. A sponsor has died and we're going to it. And he said, and those of you who are here from down in the Roanoke Valley, he said, when you get up there, you're to tell them that you're Bill Hollingsworth because we have a reservation for Bill and you're going to pick up his reservation. I, I didn't meet Bill till after that and the idea of my ever being Bill Hollingsworth blows the mind. But, uh, though, and I know many of you know Bill dearly and, 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 and remember him and, and pray, you know, and gratitude towards him and what he meant to so many of us. And I, I got in the car and drove to Akron. And this old boy that was with me, his name was Willard, and he'd been in the program about 35 years, and his wife had been in Allen on 125 years. <laughs> And the reason I knew it was she got in the back seat and went to sleep. And we had a four and a half hour big book meeting all the way to Akron. And I learned from Willard what this program was about. And they say that when the pupil is ready, the, teacher, the, the, the teachers will arrive. And they started to come in droves. And I got to Akron, the Founders Day, for those who may not be familiar with it, is the birthday party of Alcoholics Anonymous given by the Akron in a group at the, on the campus of Akron University. And there were 5,000 happy, joyous, and free alcoholics pouring off of buses, out of cars, whacking each other in the back, having the grandest old time. And this shaky little guy that's scared to death to leave Dayton is standing there. And I walked over, and I found a guy, familiar face, a guy named Art that I knew from another group. And he sat me down on this, this bench, and we sat there. And people kept coming up and calling Art and saying, Art, how are you? Good to see you. Wonderful. And they'd look at me and say, hi, how are you? And I'd shake my hand. And then I'd, they'd go on. And, and I went back to Willard after about 15, 20 minutes of this, and I said, Willard, I just found a guy from my home group named Art. And he's sitting over there on that bench. And damn, I didn't know. Art's a really important guy in AA. He said, everybody that comes over and talks to him. Everybody knows him by name. They pat him on the back. They shake his hand. I said, you know, I just wish that someday if I stay in AA long enough, I'm going to be as popular and as, as well-known as Art. And old Willard, he put his arm around me and he says, Ed, I got a little secret for you. I said, what's that? He says, you can be as popular as Art today if you do one thing. And I said, what's that, Willard? He said, put your damn name tag on. <laughs> And he was right. Five minutes later, I knew everybody in AA, and everybody in AA knew me. It was wonderful. It was just wonderful. 
I did what you guys have done this weekend, and I didn't do. I stayed up all night for two nights. I went back on Sunday and picked my bag up off the cot where it had been put on Friday. I hadn't bathed. I hadn't changed. I hadn't done anything. I just couldn't get enough of this. I was wired on caffeine, but, you know, that was it. But I got the feel. I took the pilgrimage. I saw, I heard, and learned about it. And for the first time, I appreciated the incredible strength of this fellowship, the worldwide strength and the power of it. And when Sunday came around and we stood in that huge uh, field house, 5,000 strong, and held hands at a choir called the Serenity Singers, sang the Serenity Prayer, and then followed it by singing the Our Father. And the tears were pouring down my face. And it was a, a black man from California who had to be about six foot nine. And so my arm was up here and a little old gray haired lady from Connecticut down here. And I'm standing like this and I'm trying to go like that to get the tears off my face. And I looked up and this big son bitch is crying like crazy and a little old lady's crying. And I was safe. I was delivered. Free at last. Carol will tell you, from there on in it never changed. I came back to Dayton and AA became my life. I did all the things you guys are doing. We went to conferences, we did all that, and we still do. I had an opportunity to go to New York, and because of my writing background and interest in these things, I got deeply involved in the archives and found out through Nell Gwynn how this program started in different places and got thoroughly immersed in the history of AA. I read everything I could get my hands on. I got involved in service work. I did whatever I was asked to do, and I started to grow. And of course, of course, I got a sponsor. And I got more than one as time went on, but I got one in the beginning who was just perfect for me because he took time with me and so on. And I started to learn these steps. And I started to learn something that was so much important. I started to develop the beginning of a relationship with this higher power that had saved my life. I wanted to know this God of my understanding better. And I learned and I heard Sandy B. talk about this one time, and, and, and I, I feel very strongly that the power of these steps basically is to help us to remove those obstacles that stand between us and a relationship with the God of our understanding. And as these steps remove that guilt, and as these steps remove the, the inability to deal with other people and to be part of society. And as these t steps taught me how to take my own inventory and be honest with myself and so on, so too did they open the way and clear the path for me to have a better understanding and a relationship with the God that had saved my life. And that relationship started to grow. And that was so critical that it grow, grew because there was only one thing in my life I never wanted to drink again. And you told me I didn't have to worry about drinking again, provided I maintained a sound spiritual condition. And that meant that I had to get closer to this God of my own understanding. And I developed that contact and, that, and, and through prayer and meditation, try very hard to improve it. And the steps led me into a way of looking at things and changing my value systems, going through what the big book says is a spiritual experience, namely a change in the way I react to the f factors and the things that happen in my life. And things happened in my life that were good and things happened in my life that weren't so good. But after about eight months in the program of man, the man who came to see me in the hospital came to me and said, Ed, I would be interested in knowing whether you would consider coming into my company as vice president. The person who has been helping hold my company together while I was out drinking, and I met last night in his hospital room where he is dying of cancer, and I told him about you, and he told me to hire you as fast as I could. And I went to work for Jake, and we have a wonderful friendship. I don't work with him anymore. We split after six years, but we doubled the size of his company, and I was able to use some of my skills again. And we and I went on then, and Kara was offered an opportunity to get involved in helping others in Georgia. We built a home down there ourselves, uh, a log home that we built together and didn't get divorced over, so that says something about Alan on an AA. Uh, and we loved it and lived there. We lived down there for about six years. and and then moved up here when another opportunity came up. All through this, there was something going on that said there is a payoff for this, that God had a plan, there was something he wanted for me to happen. Kara mentioned our son John yesterday. That payoff came, it began when I was first two years into, into sobriety, and for some strange reason of our four children, the youngest, the boy, seemed to have very little interest in what his father was doing by way of recovery. 
and AA or anything about it. My three daughters were real cheerleaders. They were very supportive. John was polite, respectful, but rather aloof. And I was asked to speak at a dinner some 50 miles away during what in Ohio we celebrate as Gratitude Month. Many of you may do it in your groups too during during Thanksgiving or November. And I went up to this dinner. I was going up to this dinner and Kara was going to go with me and she couldn't go. And she, uh, so she said, why don't you call somebody else and ask them to drive? And I said, I don't want to. I'll go by myself. And all of a sudden, my son appeared and said, you mind if I go with you? He was about 16 at the time. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to have you. Come ahead. So he got in the car. We drove up there, and it was a big, big eating meeting. And he made a beeline for the, for the food table. And I got involved with other people. And I got seated at one table, and he got seated at another. And I completely forgot he was there. And I got up and I started to tell my story. And just as I did today, I was explaining how during the the, the days of desperation to support my drinking, I would lie and cheat and steal and and I would steal my son's money. And as I did it, it suddenly dawned on me, my God, what are you saying? That boy's in this room right now. I probably, if I hadn't been aware of it, wouldn't ever mention that. But I did. And I felt terrible about it. And going home in the car, I asked, I said to him, John, can you forgive me? And he says, yeah, it's okay. You did a lot of crazy stuff and so on. I, I used to break down the garage door when you come home Friday. I never understood that. And we talked about alcoholism. And he asked me at that time, he said, Dad, do you think alcoholism is hereditary? Boom. And I said, well, John, if you're talking about genetics, is it passed on from generation to generation through the genes? There's a lot of people studying that. Some think it is, some don't. But... That really isn't important to me. I said, what's important for me, and perhaps is important to you, is that my father, your grandfather, was an alcoholic. And I became an alcoholic despite the fact that I didn't want to be one. And I said that, uh, that you drink, you'll drink, and you're probably wondering whether it can happen to you. The only thing I can say to you is, look in the mirror. You saw everything that went on in my life, the progression of this illness. And I said, if those things start to happen to you, the blackouts, the shakes, and all these types of things that go on, the needing the drink and so on, then, John, don't fool around. You're probably an alcoholic. There's a good chance. You've got, you're at risk. You know, the difference is this. When my father was an alcoholic, he died. He died from his alcoholism. And that's what I knew happened to alcoholics. And so when I became an alcoholic like him, and worse, I knew I had to die. And that's what I expected to happen. But you know differently. You know from what's happened with me and in our family that when an alcoholic seeks help, when an alcoholic reaches out to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, things can change. That I do not have to drink anymore, and I do not have to die of alcoholism anymore. And that our family is together today and that we are happy and we do lead a a joyous life. So I said, John, the difference is you have something to hope for that I didn't at that time. And the conversation ended. About three years later, the phone call came that Kara referred to. He was in Laramie, Wyoming at the University of Wyoming calling to say that he was going to his first AA meeting. He has been sober eight years now. We visited him last weekend. It was a marvelous, marvelous experience. But let me clear up the matter of the stolen money. I carried that guilt. John came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was about a year before I had an opportunity to attend a meeting at which he spoke. And the honesty of the program overcame him. And he stood up on that platform and he described what had happened to him. And he turned to the audience and he said, now I have to tell you something else. I have to tell you what it was like growing up in that alcoholic home. My mother was crazy. My father was a drunk. My father would get whiskey, and he would hide it, and my mother would find it. And my mother would take it away, but since they told her in Al-Anon not to flush it down the toilet, she would hide it under the sink. And when she hid it under the sink, I would go get it, take it, and drink it. My mother would think that my father had found the liquor. (laughs) And she wouldn't be, she'd be upset at him and never think it was me said the only problem was my father didn't have money to buy liquor so I would have to leave my money out on the dresser (laughs) so he would steal (laughs) 
Have you ever sat in an AA meeting where you want to jump up and yell at the speaker, you son of a bitch? <laughs> Five years of guilt for that. I should have killed him. It's been a beautiful life. It's been a joyous life every single day of it. And I want to add one little message that I like personally to convey to you in this room because it's something that, that is disturbing me. And I think you're the people that I need to, to get this off my chest with. When I came into this program, there was much, much laughter in our meeting rooms. People took a look at us, and if we had troubles, they told us, don't worry about it, keep coming back, read the big book, talk to your sponsor, work the steps, it'll get better. But somewhere along the line, many, many, many of the meetings that I have been attending have turned into what a friend of mine described one time when I was going to a group meeting in Chicago, and he said, Ed, you don't want to go to that meeting, it's a W and S group. And I said, what's a W and S group, Joe? And he says, a whining and sniveling group. And so, unfortunately, I'm seeing more and more whining and sniveling groups, where we sit around these tables and let and just feed each other on the despair and the life is a bitch syndrome and so on. And I wonder what happened to the big book where it says we are not a glum lot. The joy of living is the theme of our 12 steps. And I am not hearing the laughter in meetings that I used to hear. And I am hearing things in meetings that disturb me. I walked out of a meeting in New York after 40 minutes of listening to people giving somebody advice about how to deal with their damn landlord. I walked out of a meeting in Georgia when everybody tried to tell somebody how to raise their stepchildren who were starting to smoke pot. And I, the thing about it was there were people in that meeting who have good AA programs who are living the happy, joyous, and free life that we enjoy and are seeing here this weekend. And they sat on their hands because they didn't want to offend anybody by saying that's not what this program is about. If you don't have a sponsor, get a sponsor. And if you have a sponsor, use the sponsor and take your troubles to that sponsor and let that sponsor show you how this program can help you through this. There isn't a single person in this room that hasn't gone through those problems. But we don't sit around tables and cry about it over and over and over again. I've had some experience recently. It's not the greatest fun on earth. It's worse than a, than a root canal. Working in an ASAP group where they come in miserable, mad, angry, you know, all this stuff, and they're sent by a court to AA, and I ask them what their reaction is, and they, they come back universally, and granted, their attitude sucks. But they come back with a truth that bothers me. They say, I don't want to go to AA. I want to get sober. And all those people do is sit around these tables and bitch and moan. If that's happening in your group, and I hope it isn't because it's not universal. If that's happening in your group, I beg you, let's turn it around. Let's make AA meetings the happy things they are. I'll never forget an experience in Memphis, Tennessee, when I went to a, find a meeting in a gigantic a uh, church that had a, had, a, had a meeting hall or a, a building that was like a university. It went on for miles, big, gorgeous, fieldstone building. And I'm marching down these corridors. It's like being in Oxford or something like that, or Yale. And there's room after room of people sitting around doing Bible study and having financial meetings. And, and I'm looking for the AA meeting. And I'm feeling, you know, the usual whore in church type of feeling when you do that sort of stuff. And a very nicely dressed man came out and he said, may I help you? And I said, yes, I'm looking for the AA meeting, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, oh, he said, go down the next corner. He says, you won't have any trouble finding them. They'll be laughing and you'll hear them. And I said to myself, what a wonderful testimony to this program. That these people who are wrapped up in themselves and their business and their so on recognize that, that you can find the AAs in this building. Go where you hear the laughter. Let's keep our meetings positive. Let's keep them upbeat. Let's not turn our back on the troubles and tribulations and living concerns of our, of our fellows, but we have a mechanism for it. We have a program that does that. It's done it since the very first day. The troubles that young people are having today in this program are no different than the ones that were encountered by the early members. But we, we, we turn these meetings into group therapy bitch sessions, and we're driving the old timers away, and that scares me. And we who have committed to it, you who are convention and conference and roundup junkies, who come to these meetings to hear positive, 
positive talks, carry them back. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. It saved my life. I didn't set out in life when they had me headed on that track to be an archbishop somewhere. I was going to jo jo join everything that was wonderful on earth. And somewhere on that list, there wasn't one line that said, join Alcoholics Anonymous. But if I only had one thing that I could belong to in my life, it would be the program and a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, because it's where I find the real people. We all remember that wonderful, wonderful testimony to our program that the Reverend Harry Emerson Fostick made uh, some many, many years ago, when he said that if Christ were to come back to earth and look for his followers, he would be better off looking in the basements of churches than up in the sanctuaries because it is in the meeting rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that we see the experience the nearest thing to first century Christianity. People who give to each other love without any expectation of return, without any qualification. That's what I have found in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what's in Alcoholics Anonymous today. And I hope that as we go forth from this beautiful, glorious, fine, happy weekend, that we carry that back to our home groups and share it with others. And I'm grateful for the, having the opportunity to be here with you and share it with you. God bless you all. sharing. Uh, the Roundup Committee has a token of appreciation uh, for your sharing. Thank you. Are there any other announcements that need to be done? Anything else taken care of? Okay. Would those who care to help me close with the Lord's Prayer? Uh, Lord. Lord.